the goal for each podcast episode is for us to be honest, open, and transparent. While conversations do include mental health, this show does not replace support from a licensed mental health professional. If you feel triggered by any of these conversations, please feel free to take a break from the episode and check in with your support system. And I share that with everyone that I talk to. We need to say the words, we need to talk about it, and we need to say that it's okay to feel crappy and to have not good days and to struggle because once we share that with somebody with that, that one trusted adult, then everything can change after that at, you know, their own pace. Each individual person has a pace, but I feel like the more we talk about it, the more it's going to become normal. What's going on, everyone? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Unlearn the Lies About Mental Health, the podcast. I am your host, Abraham Scully, and you are tuned into the podcast for leaders in education and students who are leaders on their campus who are wanting to learn how to create safe spaces for honest dialogue about mental health. So if you are a frequent listener of the podcast, then uh, I just want to say we're grateful for you to be listening. And thank you for sharing your feedback and thank you for sharing the podcast. If this is your first time listening to the show, thank you and welcome to the podcast. Feel free to hit that subscribe, follow, or whatever that thing is for podcasts and also share it out if you find value in it. Just like every other episode, our goal is to bring immense value to you. And today is like every other show. I have an amazing guest, one that I am super, super excited to introduce you to. And um, I think this conversation is going to be phenomenal for many different reasons, which you'll probably identify once we get the conversation going. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce you, Melanie. Melanie, how are you? Hello, everybody. And I'd like to say I am so happy to be here. This is just a great opportunity for me to share what Broward College has been doing. And um, I'm so grateful that you and I connected. You were the first guest speaker that we had at Broward College when I started the initiative for the, the grant. And your guidance and support really helped navigate, helped me navigate through everything and helped launch everything to be where it is today. So I want to thank you for that as well. Yeah. My, my background is licensed mental health counselor. I was a, a, I worked in the field for about 11 years prior to coming to higher education. I did work in educational settings. So I am very familiar with mental health in the educational setting from pre-K all the way up to now college. And so coming into this field as a higher ed and licensed mental health counselor, I was able to support my current position, which is a manager of our outreach department, which we call the Seahawk Outreach Services Department. And we support our students with non-academic challenges. And so it's a lot of social work support, connecting our students to resources in varying areas, such as housing difficulties, food insecurities, mental health child care needs, you know, with financial needs being on top of that and transportation, the, we, we try our best to reduce the, the, the technology gap for a lot of our students here in Broward, uh, Broward County that come to Broward College. So we, lo- we loan them laptops and all of that comes through our office. And we have an office on each major campus that supports all the students. So in, as of September 2021, we were awarded the Garrett Lee Smith uh, campus suicide prevention grant and Melanie I'm so sorry to cut you off but you are on a roll right now so <laughs> if you're listening to this now you see why I am such a fan of Melanie <laughs> we're gonna dive into all of that but I I want to touch on a few pointers um, before we dive into that grant which you have really you know taken to another level for Broward College but also for the community at large So we're definitely going to get into that. Before we even do that, I keep doing this. And this is probably the third show where I forget to ask the guests, how do you pronounce your last name? So (laughs) so I want to make sure 
that our listeners know who they're talking to. So we have Melanie and then, so give us your, your name. <laughs> Ganesda Gilson. So Ganesda is my maiden name. Gilson's my married name. Boom. Melanie mm -hmm. Ganesda Gilson. Okay. Right. All right. We got it. So, <laughs> so, so thank you so much for joining the show and thank you for the amazing introduction and, and also the kudos. I, I was super Absolutely. grateful to have the opportunity to work with you and your amazing team. I mean, when I, when I met you, excuse me, when I met you at Broward College, no, I mean, even before that, when I met you on Zoom, before we even started working together, uh, it was very evident that I would enjoy our professional relationship because one thing that I'm very mindful of and uh, appreciative of is educators, and this is faculty and staff, who are in the field of education, but also have a passion around mental health. And what I've noticed with you is the passion is there not only for students, but also for, for staff. And it's very evident from our first conversation. So just as you are, you know, sharing some kudos about, you know, the work that uh, Speaks to Inspire has been able to do with Broward College, I am so grateful that you've been able to become a client of ours because you're the type of people that we love working with. <laughs> and unfortunately, not everyone in education um, comes with that same passion and desire for creating significant impact on, on campuses. So we're, we're super grateful, um, to be, be connected with you. So you told us a little bit about your role. I'd love to hear maybe a little bit about your background. Where does this, where does this desire or even passion come from to have such this, you know, drive and passion towards mental health, well-being, uh, suicide prevention, I saw recently you did a post about attending a, a walk, maybe a 5K walk or so, spreading mental health awareness and awareness mm -hmm. on mental illness. So we don't often see this sort of like passion and drive from our educators and not to say that it should be that way, but it's because, you know, there's a lot of other things that they are prioritizing, you know, and so, which is, which is a great thing, but there's something special about the way you approach the, the work of mental health and well-being, but then also your specific role at Broward College. Where does that come from for you? Well, I'm, it's rooted in the, I guess, the parenting that I received. Both of my parents were, were helpers and very passionate about what was going on around them and not just in our little cosmo, you know, not in our little center circle. It really was about our our home, our neighborhood, our community, our city, you know, it really, they really were passionate about politics and civil rights and, you know, just everything that had to do with, with equity. And I grew up with that as their example. I, my father was a, an English teacher in one of the, one of the roughest schools in the Bronx when he was in, when he first got out of, of college. My mom worked at a special needs school in Miami down by Jackson Memorial. And when I was 13, I would volunteer with her. So I started with the volunteerism way early. And that was something that became like a, a part of me. I would, I became the president of the interact club in high school where I would reach out to group homes or uh, children's, you know, societies and stuff like that and do fun activities, bring my peers with me to help lift up the spirits of others. And so I've always felt like I've gotten so much out of that. It's, it's just for me to give to others and to teach them that their worth, their, their self-worth is, is the most important thing has, has been something that I've grown from. I was a peer mentor in high school. Hmm. I was also a leader in, in, you know, volunteer group for, for college, all of the fraternities and sororities would get their philanthropy hours from the events that I coordinated. And so as, at a young age, I knew I wanted to help. And uh, my dad always said, you're going to be the one that helps others. You know, there are some people that need help. And there are people that help others and that's you. And, and so I really wasn't encouraged to, to follow that passion early on. 
Well, shout out to great parenting. <laughs> That's amazing. And just to instill that into uh, you at such a very young age and even talking about <clears throat> mental health and struggling with mental health conditions, a huge component of whether it's recovery or just maintaining your mental health does have to do with helping other people. Like, how can I take the focus off of me for a moment and support someone who is in a maybe worse or situation than I am? And then I can, you know, maybe it's selfish in a way, but I am able to have some sort of clarity on my value and my worth as a human being because I can see how I'm helping someone else. So I think that's really cool that they instill that in you. So when I look at you and the work that you're doing behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and then also like when I log into LinkedIn and I see, oh, you're getting this certification and you're at this walk and you're presenting to these folks and you're at this conference and you're doing all these things. I would look at you and consider you a mental health advocate. Would you say the same that you are an advocate for mental health? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, what does that um, mean for you? The, the Being a mental health advocate means that I understand that it's okay to not be okay, which is the term we've heard, right? And that the, it's a public health issue. And I can't just sit in one spot and think that I'm going to make a difference if I just help the students that are sitting right in front of me, or if I just help that one other person that contacted me because they heard through the grapevine that I have, you know, knowledge about it. I feel like, especially in the last year or so, that I've met some individuals that have inspired me as well to, to reach out to the community, to put, put out their more clear concise and particular language that is going to encourage our, our community to reduce that stigma. And as you would say, unlearn the lies, because if you, if there's stigma is holding you back from, from getting that help that you need, or, um, you know, or you're afraid to, to, to be honest with what's, what you've been cha challenged with or struggling with, then it's going to continue to get worse. And we can't, we can't do that to each other. We can't let ourselves, you know, fall down that rabbit hole of, of struggling and, and pain. And, you know, something you said to me in, in your, your share, when you, when you did your speaking engagement with us, was that if you, your pain gets transferred to the loved ones, when you, when you take that step of either, you know, attempting to hurt yourself or completing suicide and that has stuck with me for, for since the since the minute I saw it and they, and you could hear a pin drop in the room it was just so impactful and I share that with everyone that I talk to we need to say the words we need to talk about it and we need to say that it's okay to feel crappy and to have not good days and to struggle because once we share that with somebody with that, that one trusted adult then everything can change after that at, you know, their own pace. Each individual person has a pace. Um, but I feel like the more we talk about it, the more it's going to become normal. A hundred percent. So you work with a lot of students. You've done events for students. You've done events mm -hmm. with students. As it relates to you being a mental health advocate for students, because as you know, sometimes students have a hard time speaking up for what they need and and advocating for themselves and taking advantage of different accommodations that are accessible to them. And a lot of that comes from just being a young person or being unaware of what they have access to. So someone in your position who does have some level of authority, some sort of power, and you can make things happen or bring awareness to things that students don't don't know about, um, it empowers a young person to, to either ask for what they need, be more assertive, and if there are things that are unfair or unjust, and, and I think you utilize your influence in that way in many ways. First, just by your example, you know, just leading by example, students see that and say, oh, I can do that as well. But when it comes to advocating for students, 
right? Like, what does that look like? What does it mean to be a mental health advocate for your students, like on the mm -hmm. ground, mm -hmm. speaking up, showing up for them, being the voice for them when they're not able to do that themselves? It's, it's actually like, I, I, the compassion that I've, that I have inside, it has to come out at some point, at some way. And so when I interact with, with students, they know that I'm authentic. And I think that's a huge, huge part of, of making anyone in your area or in your presence feel comfortable and feel safe. And I share sometimes at a certain point, you know, personal stuff um, or share that I've heard that other people have felt the same way or that I had another student that experienced the same way, the same thing. And that opens up the door to them knowing they're not alone. Yeah. And that's what mental health advocacy means to me is that when I interact with the student or a group of students, I let them know that they're not the only ones. They're not the only ones that have struggled. Um, in the course, you mentioned the certificate that I just completed. Um, they talked about ACEs, you know, the adverse childhood experiences. And um, one of the main things was understanding that you don't know what that, so on the outside, we look fine. You know, I don't have a visible disability, right? I don't have, I can see, I can hear, I can speak, I'm cognitively, you know, processing everything, but you don't know what I'm struggling with inside. And so when I share about mental health adv advocacy to my students and to, to faculty and staff when I'm speaking with them too, it's that you just don't know what they're going through inside. And everyone needs to just have compassion and empathy, regardless of who they are, where whether they're the, the, the staff that clean the, the, the offices or whether they're the president of the college all across the board. And that's what mental health advocacy means to me. And that's what I try to instill as a leader in this mission at Broward College to share with others that that is what you do. You treat everyone with kindness and then they will feel comfortable and safe. And safety helps bring out those, those struggles that they are hiding that may be in the dark. Yeah. The one thing you shared, and I'm so glad you brought it up, ACEs, and and the importance of just knowing what that is and the impact it has on people. I think when we talk about adverse childhood experiences and even the word trauma, sometimes mm -hmm. there's this misconception that trauma looks one way. And it wasn't until like a few years ago that I learned that it is actually a traumatic event for your parents to divorce. Mm -hmm. And my parents divorced when I was 14. I obviously saw the changes that happened in me after that happened, but never did I think that that was trauma or anything related to trauma. I was thinking, well, you know, for people who have been physically or sexually abused or, mm -hmm. you know, have been in war, that's the only trauma that exists. But understanding ACEs in the way that it is really, you're able to now, you know, have the awareness to know man, maybe there is some level of trauma that I've experienced. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why I see the world the way I do. I show up and, and engage with people the way I do. And the more we have that awareness, the better equipped we are to do something about it. So I love that you even share that because many people don't know or haven't heard of ACEs or even think about what role trauma plays in the lives of the students that they serve. And trauma shows up, right? So it's mm -hmm. important to even, you know, to know about it. But I want to dive into some of the work that you've done boots on the ground at Broward College. Are there any student mental health and well-being initiatives that you've done to support students on your campus? This podcast is powered by Speaks to Inspire, the mental health solution for young adults suffering in silence. Did you know that students who experience shame and hold negative perceptions about mental health conditions are less likely to reach out for help? By marrying the art of storytelling with mental health education, Speaks to Inspire is creating safe spaces through comprehensive, high-impact programs that help colleges, universities, and schools increase engagement and retention. Learn how you can bring a Speaks to Inspire speaker to your campus by visiting www.speakstoinspire.com forward slash speakers. So some of the events and um, initiatives that we've started are 
So we have a tradition now to do a mental health awareness festival. Oh, and wow. we usually Is that do new? it. In, it's we've we had I think we've had we've had a few and I think it was after you and I finished our consultation that we started really doing it at every campus. So it's interesting because we did it first at Central Campus with the Psi Beta Psychology Honors Club. And I always want to collaborate, which you mentioned earlier, I collaborate with students, I collaborate with faculty staff, you know, different academic programs, but the students have, a, have had this, they put, they infuse this really great fun aspect to it because mm. mental health can be a very scary conversation. Sometimes it can be very deep and dark. And so when we instill some of these fun activities that are self-care activities, which is another thing that we're trying to make sure that students understand that anything you do that helps reduce that stress is a self-care act. Mm. And, and, and self-awareness is huge. So we're trying to infuse that into it as well. So the mental health awareness festivals include about eight to 10 community agencies that are in Broward County that support different mental health challenges and presenting problems, eating disorders, domestic violence, substance misuse, suicide, uh, survivors of suicide, family members living with someone with a mental health condition, mm -hmm. you know, just a variety of things. And of course, we also promote our Broward College student assistance program. So that is part of our marketing to increase the knowledge that this service is here for you. It is included in your fees. Please take advantage of these free sessions that you get from a professional and no problem is too small is their, is their little catchphrase, which I think I like a lot. You know, I use it a lot. And so we've had a few of those. We've had, uh, we've had two at Central Campus. We've had one at South and one at North. And the clubs and organizations that I, that I um, collaborated with infuse their own interesting sp spin on it. So we would have painting rocks, you know, with for you know, kindness rocks or for a friend or someone else, stuffing a bear. There's a, a vendor that we have that has this really awesome bears like Build-A-Bear, but you know, off brand. And the kids, well, students loved it. I call them kids. And and, and it's and one of them I walked by, it was a young man and I said, Yeah, that's so cute. You picked the giraffe or whatever. So they're all different animals, you know, not just bears. And I said, Are you making that for someone special? And he was like, Yeah. And he like <laughs> blushed, you know. And I was like, Doesn't it feel good to do something for someone? You're thinking of them and they're gonna really appreciate that, you know. And so I wanted him to check in with himself and feel that that you know that serotonin that was being released from his brain you know and the the caring gesture that he's doing understand that you did something nice for somebody and check in with yourself and so we've done stuff like that we've done we've had a, a yoga demonstration where we actually had students and and staff on the courtyard do yoga we've had let's see uh, mission we've had the vision boards and mm -hmm. and the coloring you know the very detailed coloring and I check in with them I walk a, I let them be for a little while and then I walk over and I'm like How, oh wow that looks great I love the colors you chose doesn't it feel good to just focus on something just so calming and you know so that's what I kind of infuse and I've learned that from the assistant director of wellness who I've collaborated with a few things as well she works mainly with staff and we've collaborated on a few things to also help our staff because you know the Virgin Airlines guy says you know if your staff isn't happy then your customers will be happy Right. And that's where we also are, are, are infusing, you know, that, that into the staff as well, like you mentioned. So those are some of the events we've had guest speakers um, like yourself. Um, we've had uh, a lot of individuals that have come out to share their lived experience. And I feel that that has made a huge impact because when they see someone that is closer to their age, that looks like them, talks like them and has experienced something adverse and they share how they've, conquered that and one of the things that they talked about in the professional certification was resilience right and knowing that you have skills to get through that that challenge and remember that you can use those skills again in another challenge you know and there may not be a there may not be a smooth road after that big challenge but there may be smaller bumps in the road and so those are some of the things that we've done in terms of the initiatives um so we've also done social media campaigns, 
And so we've done that self-care. Uh, the very first one that you saw the poster that we made, it's let's talk about mental health. When I first got this project to be the, the project director of this grant, I started reading up on how am I going to do this? I know how to do counseling, right? And I know how to tell somebody, right? And I know how to tell somebody what resources are out there, but how am I going to do this global, like I really was thinking global, right? This global public health project I just was, I just received, um, you know, and, and I just had to think I need, I'm a lot, I'm a lifelong learner. And that's probably why I've always been in the educational system in some way or another. Um, so I, I learned about mental health literacy and I read some scholarly articles about mental health literacy. And that's where I started that, that let's just talk about it. I started off with, you know, self-care and then we talked about suicide and I got wheels and I, you know, these fun pamphlets and just things that said how to how to how to manage your anger without hurting yourself or others mm. is one of the titles or how to have safe relationships or know when you need to ask for help so these pamphlets were passed out at all these different in, you know events and i gave some to some of the groups like peer mentors and the trio sss group and so we that's the way i felt like it could be introduced yeah you know and and, and and doing some fun stuff too. And you've done that and so much more because I'm also aware that you've done a ton of QPR uh, suicide prevention training. And mm -hmm. if I get it correctly, it, it's been done for students and faculty and staff. So give Perfect. me a number, like uh, what would you say around how many people have been trained at Broward College? At Broward College wow. so far. So our goal was a hundred a year. Yeah. And we've surpassed that. I've also done the QPR training with Hispanic Unity, which I, oh. I shared on, on on LinkedIn. So and I've I was I was reached out I reached a consulting firm reached out to me called Hyman Consulting. And they had reached out to all of us actually in the area because they're out of Delray. So through the QPR Institute, we can also do QPR trainings for the community. So I mm. did one for veteran counselors and I also plan on doing a few for, so we, I, I made a connection with a community grassroots agency called Deerfield Community Cares. Okay. And one of my speakers actually connected me to them. And this is grassroots out of this, this, this gentleman who is, you know, the co-founder and CEO has brought it up because of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting and all the support that was flooded into Parkland after this tragedy. And he thought, well, we've had suicides. We had two students that walked in front of a train. Deerfield mm -hmm. Beach High School is directly across the street from a train track. And they had two students that died by suicide. And he's like, I got to get some support into this community. And he's one of those gentlemen that likes to get into good trouble, right? So he started this this foundation and, and well, it's an age, it's, it's more of a support community agency. So I'm going to be doing some QPRs for his wow. community board and maybe some of the individuals in Deerfield. He's going to come and do a training for us on ACEs. So we're really collaborating to, to really reach out and share our knowledge, share the, the, the skills that we learned in our life and, you know, in our academic and career, you know, Amazing. journeys. Amazing. Yeah. And so many people are listening to this, especially uh, educators, administrators, different staff. And similar to you, the passion is there. The desire is there to help to bring more awareness to mental health and suicide and all these different things. But the resources aren't there. One thing that is very unique about the work you're doing is that you all were we you all were able to receive funding resources, which I mean, you can't really, you know, move the needle without the money. <laughs> so yeah. what, tell us a little bit, because you've, you've mentioned briefly about the grant, um, but I'd like to bring awareness to, to some of our listeners who may not be aware of the grant that you received specifically. Um, can you provide information on the GLS Campus Suicide Prevention Grant? And, and then, yeah, so let, we'll start there. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, yes, so we were awarded... The GLS Campus Suicide Grant, it's through SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and they uh, 
granted us the grant um, based on our statistics that we shared at Broward, based on the the tragedy we had in, in at Parkland and and those sort of things. And so we are our objectives are as follows: we want to in, in, improve our infrastructure. So for each year, we have we are required to create an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, with a community agency that will support and and educate. So the first year we have one with NAMI Broward. The second year we we just ex executed the MOU with South Florida Wellness Network, which is the substance misuse and mental health services, mental health recreation and support group program that they have in Broward College and Broward County. So they're going to come in and do research. They're going to do workshops on prevention, and we're going to help with volunteers for events that they have and you know promote their their support services and that sort of thing we also have our broward our broward up programs that can help their their clients that are ready to i guess you know return to the to the employment you know sector after recovery and so we're going to help connect them to certificates and you know to to level up and help them with their their career paths so that's one of them. And um, we have the the awareness messages, which are included in our events that we have, like our, our mental health festivals, our social media, any of those other events that just give out that information, passing out those pamphlets and stuff. We have a goal on expanding the, the access to mental health. And so I know that, that this, since the pandemic, I've read so many articles and I can't particularly put my finger on one of them but if you just google you know the that the number of counselors or therapists per the people who are looking for those services it's overwhelming there we don't have enough professionals to take care of everyone who's reaching out for mental health counseling so we really wanted to make sure that access was improved and and so we were able to fund a part-time counselor for our current vendor and so that we increase the hours of operation from 8.30 to 5 to 8.30 to 8 p.m. On, on Monday through Thursday and then four hours on the weekend and those are telehealth hours so that also helps with some of our transportation challenges that our students have and as you mentioned the QPR, QPR was a major um, goal of ours. So we were able to receive the gatekeeper training through the funding of the grant. And we were able to um, have, we have 20 staff at Broward College, college-wide, that can deliver those trainings. So I'm not the only one. <laughs> and we all, we want to, you know, make sure that all of our staff are informed of how to help a student in, in need. And it's really like CPR. Any non-clinical staff can can perform the steps of questioning, persuading them that individual to get help, and knowing how to refer them. So we provide them with resource lists, and they also get a QPR card that has the 988 number on it, and we give them you know that that for their toolbox. Awesome. And we also have a train you know the goal of making sure that there. Our students, staff, and faculty that attend workshops by SMEs, you know, the subject matter experts. So we've had uh, Dr. Julie Radlauer Dorfel come out and do a social media and your mental health workshop. And she used data. She was, it was very educational. So it kind of was infused into our educational purposes as well as knowledge based to understand what does social media do to your to your to your emotions and your 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 happy hormones and then what happens if you don't get enough likes and what happens if you are are just going down that rabbit hole and you're you have that fear of missing out you know the fomo right and so we there were these really interesting conversations that students you know brought up during that time and so we have all of those goals and it's really to to do that that pebble that pub you know that pond effect where you throw that pebble in and the ripple effect yeah. of helping like if somebody goes to that workshop and they say they they see a friend struggling they're gonna be like oh well you know what i heard and what i learned and we're hoping that that's going to be the case i love it so two very important resources that you shared in all of that is samsa so for those of you who have never heard of samsa it's actually s-a-m-h-s-a and it stands for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. 
And, and there are a lot of funding opportunities, grants that are available. You can even subscribe to their newsletter to receive updates on what's coming and what's available now. Another resource you shared is NAMI, N-A-M-I, and that's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And so typically, uh, or for the most part, there are chapters, NAMI chapters in states all over the country. So you can go to NAMI.org and put your zip code or state and possibly find a chapter that you can get plugged into in your local area. They have a ton of free resources, which is really cool. And so just getting plugged in. And then the SAMHSA, the website for SAMHSA is S-A-M-H-S-A.gov, G-O-V. So man, I feel like we can talk all day, Melanie. (laughs) Man. We could, we could. Yeah. So I got two final questions and then we'll wrap it up. You talked about stigma and how it's so important to reduce that stigma. And that's one of the focus points that you have Mm -hmm. within the grant, because Mm -hmm. how can we get students or anyone to, you know, seek support if there is that shame associated with it? Mm -hmm. So that has to be a component. How can we eradicate mental health stigma? I think that one of the things that we could do is the peer-to-peer support really would would launch it. And so one of the goals is to try to have a student mental health advocacy club on on one of our campuses or our, or a college-wide club or on every campus because when they when you hear it from a peer like I mentioned before, I think it will be more easily received. So that's just one like actionable thing. But I think putting out messages on all of our social media and, you know, making sure that we 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 share that we are we are here for them, that it's it's something that that is normal to to have challenges, that we normalize it, like I mentioned earlier. But eradicating stigma is going to be much harder if there are the when there are the cultural boundaries as, as well. So we have to be culturally sensitive. Um, to that, to to the, because I live in, in Broward and I grew up in Miami and I've always been around multicultural, you know, peers and, and anybody, you know, my family always had friends from all different backgrounds. And so I, I've always, like I said, learned, wanted to learn about other cultures. So one of the things we we should do to eradicate it is to go into churches and go into, you know, the, the religious sects of of certain cultural backgrounds i think to be able to share that your pastor is helping you in a way that 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 a therapist could so it's it equate it with your your sharing your feeling safe in this environment that's what mental health advocacy is and that's what you know getting help for your challenges looks like you know and and i don't know if i'm you know overstepping uh you know my boundaries or thinking too big or, or whatever the case may be. But I think that breaking down those cultural barriers is going to be a huge win to reduce or eradicate, as you said, if we're thinking we're going to wipe it out completely, because that's what eradicate means to me, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Then we need to, we need to be real and we need to step up and we need to say, it's okay in any culture and any, in any language, you know, we, we have our, our mental health website and we have the warning signs for suicidal and homicidal um, behaviors in French. And uh, we will be, we were going to do French, but we have Creole, Spanish, and English wow. because we want that, we want that barrier to be broken down. If there is a language barrier, because we have a lot of Latin, Latino, Latinx, and, you know, people of color that attend Broward college. It's a minority you know, serving institution. So we want to make sure that we share that with them, that it's okay. And that's the eradicate word for me to eliminate or to, you know, reduce is where we are right now. We're, we're, we're trying to reduce it. We're trying to reduce the stigma. I I like eradicate. I know you do. I know. (laughs) Let's Let's wipe it out. Let's just wipe it out. (laughs) Go yeah. big or go home, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So final question, Melanie, what is mental health to you? Mental health is physical health. Mm. It's all in, it's all entwined. If you, uh, if everything is connected, you know, 
our head, our mind, and our, you know, like I, I saw this, this, it was a quote, I'm probably going to get it wrong. I don't know if anyone saw Ted Lasso, but I just love Ted Lasso, right? So he said something about, you know, he was having a conversation with his boss and she was struggling with a decision she was going to make. And he said, well, you know, on the way down to your gut, check in with your heart because everything is connected. Like, you know how we always say, follow your gut. Yeah. But your so your, your brain is telling you it's releasing these hormones that actually give you butterflies in your stomach. It's not just, it's, it's all connected, mm. right? So mental health is physical health. So if we're not taking care of our mental health, we're going to have physical pain. When we go to the doctor and we talk about our physical pain, I'm having more headaches. I can't sleep feeling like I am just so exhausted. I'm getting back pains. I'm getting this and that. Mm. That's all connected to your stress level. And if you don't take care of yourself, Physically and emotionally, it's all going to overflow. When I was doing counseling for younger kids, I would use an analogy of, of a cup of water. And um, if they kept having challenges or it, situations that occurred that made them angry and they kept filling up that cup, if they never let it out, like just by poking a little hole, it didn't have to be where they spilled the whole thing out. Just little by little, if they poked a hole at the bottom and they let it out, they wouldn't overflow. They wouldn't explode. Right. And so that's what mental health is to me. You have to check in, have self-awareness, know that it's connected to your physical health and know that one step closer to self-care can get you into that, that realm of feeling like you can challenge, you can have those challenges and you can overcome them. I haven't had a guest put it that way before. (laughs) Very well said. With that being said, Melanie, how can our listeners connect with you because I'm sure after this show they're like who is Melanie Ganesda Gilson I want to be her friend I want to talk to her how can they connect with you so on LinkedIn I I'm Melanie Gilson you can search for me m-e-l-a-n-i-e-g-i-l-s-o-n I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn and um I have also, you know, you can call me, you can email me at Broward College. It's M G N a i z d a or as we would spell it over the phone growing up m is in melanie g is in george <laughs> n is in nancy a i z is in zebra d is in david a at broward.edu <laughs> <laughs> i love it uh, and those are the best ways to get in touch with me i'd, I'd, I'd love also to i'd also love to highlight the great job you've done with broward college's mental health resources page so BrowardCollege.edu forward slash mental health, is it? Yes. We have yeah. Broward.edu forward slash mental health. Check it out. If you're an educator, administrator, check it out. Maybe grab some ideas on what you can do for your own campus in terms of bringing awareness to resources. But Melanie is doing great work, not only in you know at Broward College, but in her community. And I would even say in the nation, because she's man, she's reaching people all over. So I I love it. And I'm so glad to be connected with you, Melanie. I want to share some resources with everyone. And as I share some resources, I want you to think about some sort of message, word of encouragement, or anything that you'd like to share to kind of close us out. So as you're thinking about that, for those of you listening, if you did not know, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is now 988. So anyone can call or text 988 and get immediate support 24-7, speaking to a crisis counselor. It's confidential. And the the great thing about the resource is you don't have to be in crisis to reach out. Let's say it's 3 a.m. in the morning. Everyone that you know and love is asleep, and you just need to talk to somebody. You can call or text 988. Another thing is we have resources at Speaks to Inspire on our website. So things that you can, we have a mental health resource guide. You can go to speaks to inspire. That's the number two inspire.com forward slash resources and get some resources there. And then if you'd love, if you love this conversation and you enjoy the guests that we have on and you want to continue the conversation, join our Facebook group. You can just search unlearn the lies about mental health on Facebook, hit that join button. I'll let you in. You can introduce yourself and connect with other advocates throughout the country. With that being said, Melanie, close us out before we wrap it up. So I think that something that has inspired me that I hope has inspired others is that when you're kind and you're empathetic to someone, they will 
be kind and empathetic to others. And we want to spread that. We want to pay it forward. So self-awareness of how you're feeling, you know, make sure that you're taking care of yourself because if you feel yourself uh, having short temper or feeling frustrated or feeling unfulfilled in your position that you're in because you've worked so hard to help that student and it still didn't get, you know, get to that goal that you hoped for. Take care of yourself. Know that you help that one person that there's that starfish story out there, right? So remember that starfish story. You know, there, there may be a hundred students in front of you that you feel like you want to help. But if there are five out of those 100 that have come back and said, I graduated because your help, because of your encouragement, or I passed that class because you helped me find this resource that helped me, you know, overcome all these obstacles, then you did what you were set out to do. So be kind to yourself and then you will be kind to others and they will follow through and pay it forward. I love it. And with that being said, thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope this was valuable for you. Hit that like, that subscribe, share it with someone, a colleague, a friend, and we'll see you next time. Take care.